Just under the wire. Can you close that door? Out. Can you, yeah, can you close that door? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm supposed to get started right at five. So I'm um, Mike Hill, and I'm the director of web development for Ericsson Living. The title of the presentation is a little misleading. It's We're actually going to be talking more about baby boomers and people beyond and some of the UX issues related to them. Um, it's already been pointed out to me that the title is a little misleading, so it's 5 o'clock on a Wednesday evening. you got to do what you got to do. So um, we, um, we have a team of, uh, I have a team of four people. One of them's here with, two of them actually are here with me today. And uh, we, we manage our corporate site and 20 community sites within that plus a few other corporate sites that are uh, our responsibility now. Most of the sites are Drupal, a few are WordPress, and then there's one or two that are just random home-built kind of things. Um, when I started this job, I can't say that the idea of going to work at what I thought was a nursing home was the most exciting sort of step in my career, but I can tell you that having been there now for almost six years, I probably learned more about usability and how people work with websites than I've ever learned up to that point. And so most of what this presentation is about is takeaways from a redesign that we did about two years ago and what we learned about the audience, what we've been learning about the audience since, and how we sort of continue to try to learn and evolve what we do. Um, I'm really hoping that <laughs> we never do another redesign like the one we did two years ago. It was a huge effort. We basically blew the old site up and rebuilt from the ground up. And I would really rather n never do that again if we can avoid it. Um, I'm hoping that from here on out it's kind of an iterative process where we take on parts of the site and revamp them in kind of an agile sprint process. That's really what we're going for. We'll sort of see how that works. We're a company that most of our internal clients are in the marketing department, and it's an interesting sort of relationship that we have with them. And uh, it's, it's a very collaborative, back and forth sort of process. So we'll, we'll see. But anyway, um, Ericsson has 20 communities in 11 states and growing. We're getting ready to open another community in Florida. We're looking at properties in the Midwest, and we're looking at locations on the West Coast. Our CEO really wants to be the number one retirement living organization in the country. Uh, if I had to bet on it, I think in the next five to certainly 10 years, that may very well happen. We're not a nursing home. That's one of the confusions, That one of the things that's confusing to a lot of people. We're more like an apartment complex, honestly. The independent living side of the business, which is the largest part of the business, really looks like a, an apartment complex. Um, our residents lead active lives. In fact, most of the people that come to live with us who've been living on their own, especially if they've lost a spouse or been living on their own for some period of time, they generally see an uptick in their health. We have people get off of medications that they're on. We have people that Statistically, we're not really allowed to say it in, in marketing, but on average, people tend to live four to five years longer with us than they do if they live in their own homes. Um, a lot of that has to do with the socialization that they get. They tend to take better care of themselves, and they have other people to help them motivate themselves to take care of themselves. So we still have residents that run marathons, not a lot, but a few. We have residents that actively you know, exercise. We have, I don't know how many clubs and organizations that they get involved in. So they're a very active 
group of people. And part of what we'll be talking about throughout this presentation are the ways in which they, they sort of defy what we typically think of as ways that seniors interact with technology. I, I threw this quote in because I think every, quote, every presentation needs some sort of grand quote to get started with. Um, but this is from Tim Berners-Lee. And I really like sort of the last part of this, that the web really should accommodate people uh, of a diverse range of hearing, movement, sight, and cognitive ability. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today really relates to those particular issues. One of the things that I really try to work hard at is to get us to forget that we're working with seniors and just really think about them as an audience, not as sort of this monolithic group of people that can't hear, can't see, can't, you know. Those things exist, but they're not, they don't define them. And so we're gonna look at some of that and talk about how we deal with some of those issues. The other question is, why worry about seniors? I, I, I talk to people all the time that think this is kind of a throwaway audience. And a couple of stats that I have here, I think, will help change your mind about that. In 2002, 27% of the population was over the age of 50. In 2020, it's gonna to jump to 35%. And the 50 plus population is gonna double in the next, more than double in the next 35 years. So if you market products, if you market services, and you ignore this audience, you're, you could very well be cutting yourself out of 30 to 40% of the market that you could be serving. A baby boomer turns 60 every 7.5 seconds. So in the hour that it takes, well, slightly less than an hour that it takes to give this presentation, that's almost 480 people. And that's every hour. So it's an audience that is rapidly increasing. There are now more than there are now more Americans over the age of 65 than any time in the history of the country. Eight million boomers spend more than 20 hours a week online. So this audience spends a ton of time online. We're going to look at more sort of examples of that in a little bit. And they make up a third of the online and social media users that are out there. I think this one, this group is, is even maybe the most important. Those aged 50 and older spend nearly $7 billion a year online. That's $7 billion that you have access to if you're able to connect with them effectively. If you're not, that's part of what you're missing out on. More importantly, they use the internet as their primary means of research. So any major purchase that they're gonna make, they tend to go online. Not that they're the only people that do that, but I can tell you that in, in our particular situation, we used to be more of a direct sales kind of an organization. People would come into the sales office, they would sit down with a counselor, they'd work through the process, they'd come in two or three times, and eventually they would either kind of decide it wasn't for them, or they would decide to settle and move in. What we've been seeing more and more is these people are spending their time online, researching the communities that we have, deciding which one might be right for them and our competitors, and then they come in pretty much the way they come into car dealerships and everything else. They're, they know what they want, they know what they don't want, they know about the communities, and they're just ready to go. So it's really critical that you make sure that you're set up to accommodate that research and, and the things that these people are looking to learn about your company. I think this is another really important one. The notion that seniors don't use smartphones or that people over the age of 70 don't use smartphones is completely false. They actually, uh, they're actually one of the fastest growing audiences for those devices. Part of that's because they're a little bit late to the game. They're, they started buying them a little later than other people, but they're using them as much as any other group is. And if you think about it, it's the way that they stay in touch with their kids, it's the way that they see their grandkids. And if you go to buy a, a phone now, it, it's pretty much what's available for you to buy. So these people use mobile devices and they use them frequently and they use them well. So um, we spend a lot of time 
in our own company sort of talking about this and showing stats that indicate that they're doing that. So a couple of things that you have to consider when you think about this audience. Um, nearly one in five people in the US have a disability and those issues increase as we age. Uh, the oldest age group, 80 and older, are eight times more likely to have a disability than the rest of the group. And many seniors experience age-related impairments as they grow older. But it's important to remember that these are sort of natural processes. These are not necessarily situations where people can't do things anymore. They just have some challenges with some of these issues as they age. So vision, one example. Uh, contrast can be a challenge. Sensitivity to certain colors can be an issue. Perception and color perception can change as we age. And near focus issues can obviously be a challenge. So it doesn't mean you have to make everything three times bigger than it was, but you need to think about maybe the fonts need to be a couple point sizes bigger than you might make them otherwise. Personally, I think most fonts online are too small to begin with anyway. Um, I really think it's important to really think about using font sizes that aren't tied to pixels or fixed sizes. We like to use rems or ms if we can. It works better with responsive design and it also works better as content moves to other types of screens. So it makes it a lot easier to make your content portable. This just gives you, I got this from the, the AIM website. I'm going to show an example of some of the other stuff they offer in a second, but it just gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the challenges that people can have as they age. These are more extreme examples. It's important to remember that the majority of people don't really, aren't really impacted by any of these things. They probably have some vision uh, issues related just to the general process of aging, but not everyone's going to get glaucoma, not everyone's going to have cataracts, but these are some examples of what people can be dealing with. When you start talking about color, one of the things that we've put a lot of focus on in the last two years for certain is accessibility. Everything that, that's good for accessibility is really good for this audience. And accessibility is important anyway. If you're not sort of thinking about it or looking at it, you really should be. One of the things that we took a lot of time with was after we redesigned the site and we got it launched, we did our best to consider accessibility as we were building, but we were on a really, really tight rollout schedule. So we did everything we could for the rollout. And then since then, we've been iteratively kind of looping back over the site to try to address what we could. And one of the first things we looked at was color contrast. One of the things I'm going to show you in a second is we, we worked really hard to have an action color on the website. It, what we sort of term an action color is we'd like to build a, like a visual vocabulary on the site and we'd like to have certain colors related to activities. So in our case, we used an orange for anything that you could click and go somewhere else. It worked well in a couple of situations, and then there's a couple of challenges that I'm actually going to show you. But one of the things we did was check it, and we found that we weren't quite accessible with that orange. So just, I guess, about three weeks ago, we made a change across the site to, to shift the orange to a more accessible color. This is a great tool. It's real easy to use, and it'll really give you some insights into what's working and what's not working on your site. And this is one of the easier things if you built with style sheets, which it's hard to imagine you wouldn't be now, but it's a really easy adjustment to make. And they've got other tools that are really helpful, um, so it's really worth checking that out. <coughs> some of the issues that we see are, are physical. So people have, in some cases, tremors. Sometimes they have issues of being able to sit for an extended period of time. They have back issues, and they have leg issues, hip issues, whatever. Um, it's really important to think about other types of navigation. And again, it gets back to the accessibility thing. It's really important to make sure that your keyboard navigation is good. It's really important to make sure that things like voice input and, uh, and that your navigation is clear. I'm going to talk a lot more about this in a couple slides. But we're looking more and more at voice UI. I actually went to one of the presentations earlier. And one of the really interesting stats that they shared is that 
by 2020, 30% of the web interactions that occur are gonna happen through a voice interface. And we've already started looking at how we can use voice UI in, in some of our residents' apartments to allow them to request services. It's particularly useful pe for people that have mobility issues or have other types of challenges that make it a little tougher to use a traditional interface. Hearing, and you don't always think about hearing as being an issue for a website, but if you're using video as much as a lot of websites are, if you're starting to develop podcasts, if you have any sort of other audio on the site, you really wanna think about people that could be challenged by audio issues or, or hearing issues. So when it comes to video, one of the things we try to be really careful about is making sure that we never autoplay a video, that you're never gonna see a video start, <laughs> I hope, on our website by itself. Um, it, we feel like it's really, really important to keep the user in charge of the experience and not take over the experience and start driving for them. Our audience tends to be very apprehensive about interactions with websites and anything you can do to sort of keep them in charge really helps the process. As soon as you start taking that control away, that apprehension turns into skepticism and you're very likely to lose them. So this one is probably the one that you need to pay the most attention to, cognitive issues. It's a misnomer that as we age, we can't remember things anymore. People certainly, as they age, do see memory-related issues. But it is not true that everyone's gonna get Alzheimer's. It's not true that everyone's gonna lose their memory. However, there can be challenges in some cases with short-term memory. So things like forms and really deep navigation structures can represent a challenge. People can forget where things are. They forget, they know they saw something somewhere, they don't remember where they saw it. So the simpler and, and more straightforward you can keep your navigation, the more simple and straightforward you can keep your terms, the better your chances of helping people sort of stay with you and keep track of what's going on. Privacy is another big issue and with the recent kind of stuff that's been going on with Facebook, I think we're gonna actually see more evolving out of this. But they already have a skepticism about handing over their information online. They have, they have skepticism about handing over their information on the phone or even face to face. So when you build forms, it's important that you're really clear about what happens when the form submits, what you're doing with the data. And having a privacy policy helps, but that's not really the solution. You really, with in the area of the form, it's really important that they get some idea of what's gonna happen to their data once they hit that submit button. And you wanna keep the forms short. If they get really in depth, if they get really carried away, they'll bail on them. I mean, that's a common sense kind of thing that I think applies to every audience, but it's particularly relevant to this one. Um, so again, too many layers and terms. It, 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 we found that it's really important to stay away from industry-centered uh, terms, things that you know what they mean, but your audience may not. It's one of the examples of the difference between careers and jobs. The simpler the term, the more kind of obvious the term, the better. Um, it just ends up being something that they have an easier time kind of retaining and dealing with. So I put this in because I think it's important to keep in mind that older people may have some disabilities but being older in and of itself is not a disability. So you shouldn't approach the audience automatically as if they're disabled and start treating them as everything has to be bigger, everything has to be louder, everything has to be brighter. It's about accommodation, but avoiding being patronizing. So it, that sounds like an obvious thing, but it's easy to find yourself going, this is not big enough, I need to make it bigger. And pretty soon the site's just screaming, we know you're old, everything's really big, <laughs> everything's really bright, and, and people get offended. Because if you think about who this audience is, at least in our case, the people that we deal with are people who have been professionals, they've been judges, lawyers, managed large companies. To take those people and then insult them with, you know, 
patronizing interfaces is just going to drive them away. It's, it's not going to bring them close to us. It's going to push them away. So we try to spend a lot of time learning who they are. Our audience tends to be more on the professional side, and that particular audience spends about 90% of their time going online, and 82% of them have broadband. So they have the, the days when they have slow connections and can't handle sort of um, more involved interfaces are gone. One thing that we found is that after about 75, it's, it varies. And honestly, every year, as the boomers kind of come closer to us, this number creeps up. But after 75, their use drops dramatically. And what we see at that point is that their adult children or their caregivers tend to fill in and do a lot of that research with them or for them. It's really starting to be more with them, not for them. But we do see a shift. And so I'm going to show you in a second how we try to keep track of that and stay aware of it. They're online a lot. 70% of them are online every day. This one, I think, if I had had the time, I would have updated this one. But um, social media is very big with this group. Facebook is their most used channel. We've seen probably more success with Facebook in the last couple of years than anything else that we've done. Facebook advertising has been really successful for us. Facebook itself has helped drive a lot of traffic. I'm really curious to see what happens in the next few months. I think a lot's going to be determined by how Facebook handles the situation they're in right now. And I'm also a little concerned about how involved the government's going to get in sort of dictating what they can and can't do. But that's another discussion for another time. Um, usability is crucial with this group. I mean, usability is crucial with every group. With this one, it can be the difference between you having an interaction and losing an interaction. They're, they're, they're skeptical and they're, they're nervous in a lot of cases about the web to begin with. If you make it hard for them, if you make it challenging for them, they'll go. And, and they're not likely to come back. So we spend a lot of time trying to understand things about them. Talked about this already. Clarity of terms and service, services. So again, using terms that relate to things they understand, not terms you understand. In, and making sure that you're really transparent in how you talk about those things. And then I, I threw this in there because I found myself having this conversation with people a lot at work. The, the discussion would sort of drift towards, yeah, but seniors don't do that. Yeah, but seniors don't use that. Yeah, but seniors don't have smartphones. And I finally one day said, where do you guys think we are? The, the internet started in 1996. If you retired in the last seven years, you spent at least 10 years in the business place with the, where the internet was playing a, a major part in, in how business worked. Granted, it's, it's much bigger now than it was in 96, but the idea that these people retired and just all of a sudden said, I gotta get involved with this internet thing. I gotta see what this is all about. I got time now. Did you know this was out there? I had no idea. Um, it, it's, it's absurd. So it's really important that, that you get over this notion that this is all new, that, that they have, and, and you need to go slow. You know, it's just like if, if someone's hard of hearing and you talk louder, like, what do you think you're doing? I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. So I threw that one in just because I, I found that to be a recurring sort of thing. One of the things we spend a ton of time on before we did this last redesign was looking at our audience. We had tons of research. One of the great things about being in this company is that we have access to a lot of research. We have access to teams that can help us do research. We do focus groups all the time. We have um, the ability to go out and get more research done. And so the next couple slides I'm going to show you, we, in the case of our redesign, we did a lot of the research ourselves with our internal team. We did some research with an external team. And then we did some research with a variety of other tools like usertesting.com. If you've never used it, it's great. Um, it's a little less formal, a little less structured, but that's actually why we liked it and why we used it. One of the things we spent a lot of time on was understanding the groups within the group. So there's the, the 
the overarching group, and then there's the subgroups within it. In our case, it's the senior prospects. And these numbers, these brackets are, they're sort of estimates. Estimates is the wrong word. They're, 65 to 75 is the number we work with. It's probably actually a little broader one way or the other, but you have to sort of pick something. So, And then we have the adult children. The adult children are becoming a much, much bigger part of the process than they had been in the past. So we're really looking now at how we can talk to both audiences uniquely, but, but in ways that sort of overlap. So that one of the challenges we found is if you're the prospect and you feel like we're talking to your son or daughter and not talking to you, all of a sudden there's this adversarial kind of relationship that starts to develop and we don't want that. At the same time, the adult children have concerns that the prospects don't have. They're worried about, are you taking my mother or father's money from them? Are you gonna take care of them? Are they gonna be safe? Are, do you have reliable health care? Do you have reliable security? Um, the prospects are worried about how far am I from the happy hours? How far am, and I'm not joking. We, we had a photo shoot one time, we interrupted a happy hour, almost started a riot in, in the community. <laughs> um, and then there's the influencers. So those are doctors, therapists, clergy people, um, caregivers, attorneys, friends, other family members, siblings. We really, we know that all these audiences exist and they all have different concerns. So we spent a lot of time trying to understand each one of them and how to relate to them. And what we built were a series of personas. Now I know recently there's been a lot of discussion about the value of personas and whether they're a waste of time and whether you should still be doing them and they're useless. I would tell you that in my experience, I couldn't disagree more. Um, I think that personas are invaluable. I think doing everything based on personas is probably not the best idea. Um, I think they should inform what you do. I don't think they should specifically direct what you do. But without sort of going out and really getting to know the people that are in your audience, I, I just don't know how you build a site that, that meets their needs. So we spent a lot of time, this is sort of an example of a piece that was created by our external team, uh, by the, one of our vendors. And it's good, we like it. They spent a lot of time interviewing us. They interviewed some of our prospects and brought this back. We discussed it, got it revised a couple of times. But I wanna show you one that we did ourselves that I actually like better. And I'll kind of explain why I like it better. Um, these were all done based on personal in face-to-face -face interviews with people that we identified as kind of falling in different categories with us. Some that were more receptive to living in one of our communities. Other people that literally said, unless you throw a bag over me and drag me there, I will never live in one of those places. And then people that were sort of in the middle. And we didn't just want to know how they felt about living in one of our communities. We wanted to understand how aware are they of what we represent, and this is what I like the most. We spent a lot of time talking about the devices they used, and we didn't speculate, we asked them, and we actually, in some cases, got them to prove it. Like, they said, yes, I have a smartphone. Can you get online with it? I have a smartphone. And, and, then, we, and, then, we, and then we would say, well, so what do you do with it? Um, I look at stuff on Facebook. I, you know, do you fill out forms on it? No, I don't think I would do that. And, and we really got to understand how they use the devices, not just what devices do they own. And then we also spent some time getting down to what frustrates them. What do you like about websites? What don't you like about websites? And so I really, it, even though I think the other personas we did were good and really helped us, I really thought these were actually in the long run, more useful and more beneficial. These are actually done by one of the people on our team. And again, here's an example of some of the work we did with, with the external group. This one is important because if you just talk to people that like you and are telling you what you want to hear, you're going to build the wrong website. If you're not listening and talking to the people that don't like you, don't 
really believe in what you do and understand why, it's really hard to build a site that kind of meets everybody where they want to be met. And it's important to understand the realities of what are the things that you say that they don't like, you know? And it's not so much so you can not say those things, it's so you can really understand what is it about us that people have an issue with and how can we help maybe change their, their thinking? What, what are the things that we can say to them and show to them that demonstrate that maybe they don't really understand who we are? So we spent a lot of time looking at those. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at the people that like us and the adult children, because we really wanted to understand how to connect with them. And then one of the things that I think, for me, that I spent an awful lot of time doing was digging through Google Analytics. And you really can't do this work without getting a really good understanding of, of Google Analytics. Um, if you or some comparable analytics package. I'm not here to sell Google Analytics, but the data that you can get, I, I'm a big believer in not having arguments with people over things unless I have data, because it's just a waste of time, because it's just your opinion against my opinion, unless I can come to you and say, yeah, I understand you think that, you're wrong, and now I'm gonna show you why you're wrong. <laughs> and and um, so, for example, when they said, Adult children don't use our website. That's the adult children segment right there. That's the 65 plus segment right there. They're almost equal. In fact, now, th this slide's actually a little bit old. Those bars are almost even. And in some situations, th it actually shifts and the adult children represent a larger population. It's also important to, for us to not forget that someone who's, <laughs> when you're talking about somebody who's 85, their kids are not 18. They, their kids are, are in their 60s. And that means they're close to being potential prospects themselves. So while we may be having a conversation that's specifically about their parent, we can also be having a conversation with them because they're technically the next wave of residents. And, and so a lot of the language and the things we talk about are very similar. Um, the other important demographic issue, women still make up the largest part of our audience. Women are still the people that make more of the healthcare decisions. They're the people that do more of the research, whether that's the spouse, whether that's the adult child, whether it's a caregiver. And so we watch that demographic pretty closely as well. We spend a lot of time looking at the screens that they're using. This is the thing that we've seen change the most over the last couple of months, actually the last couple of years. When we started, um, desktop was probably 70%. Mobile was probably 25 to 30%. This year, we've actually hit a point where it's 50-50, and at times, it's actually skewing towards mobile. Um, we're actually seeing periods of time when we get much more mobile traffic than we get desktop or any other type of traffic. And that's really important, because while the site's responsive, we're really starting to think more about in that mobile view, what should we be offering people? What are they looking for? What are, the, what are the contextual issues that we need to be thinking about that, um, that being in that mobile environment kind of represents? You can't really see this slide really well, but we spend a ton of time looking at the pages that people go to. Where are they spending the most time? We know what we think they want to see the most. It's floor plans, it's pictures of apartments, it's pricing, and it's just general information about the community. That's historically been the case. It hasn't changed a lot in the time that I've been there, but that doesn't mean it won't change. One of the things we're doing now, we recently switched to Pardot for our email uh, automation platform. Pardot gives us a ton of analytics that we didn't have before. So now, when you complete a form, we can see the entire path that led up to that form completion, and we can start looking at what pages are referring people to that form most often, and what does that tell us? And again, one of the things I'm really fortunate uh, to have is a web analyst, and she's tremendous at reading kind of between the lines. So one of the risks with data is you can start at, kind of start flying by wire, and you, you're looking at data that says, hey, this page is the most traffic page on the site, and you sort of naturally go, okay, we gotta really focus on that page. But you really need to be paying attention as to why that's the most traffic page on the site. Sometimes it's because 
it's the page they want to get to. Sometimes it's the page you force them to get to. So you really have to be kind of looking at the numbers, understanding the numbers, and then trying to take the numbers apart and understand what it is that they're telling you. So we spend a ton of time tracking everything we do. We put UTM tracking on all our email. Any external links have UTM tracking. Any Facebook advertising, any AdWords advertising. We track everything. And we look at where people came from. We try to correlate campaigns to page views. I mean, we're, we're constantly kind of taking things apart and putting them back together to try to get a better picture of exactly what's going on. So this is our old website. This is the site that we built before the one that we have now that led to our redesign. And I want to kind of quickly walk through some of the things that we learned and, and some of the things we did. This is not the worst website I've ever seen. Um, and now I'm going to tear it all apart. Um, so there were things about this that were, that were good. It was responsive. Um, when I got there, they had just finished it. It, it didn't look bad. It took good advantage of our photography. We do all our own photography. Um, they, they did take good advantage of that. In some cases, they took too much advantage of it, and I'll show you in a second. Um, you know, we were speaking about things like video. We had kind of promotions internally. We had a lot of links, a lot of information. The problem is this thing is like a solid bar. It, it's so dense and it's so packed together that you, you, can't, you can't find anything and you can't see anything and you don't know what you're supposed to do first. People never saw this navigation. Um, there were just a lot of issues. So we started kind of taking it apart and we started thinking about how do we make this better? How can we clean this up? One of the other issues we confronted was, yeah, the site was responsive, but in the course of making it responsive, we ended up with weird problems like on the desktop, you had to click any of these navigation points and then you got this menu. So a couple of issues, you're clicking this thinking you're going to senior living options and now you get this menu. So you're like, oh, wait a minute. So, oh, now I got to read all this. Plus, who does that? <laughs> I mean, it, you're used to hovering and you get a menu. And if you don't, then you click and you go somewhere. Um, so there were a lot of behaviors on the site that just weren't expected and, and conflicted with what people would have expected to be the case. Um, this is one of the sub pages. Again, there's a toolbar here. There's things to click here. There's ad banners, there's social media. There, I mean, it's just, there's just like a ton of stuff. And if you think back to sort of the whole cognitive overload issue, People get overwhelmed and, and you give them too many choices. You feel like you're doing a good thing because you give them a lot of options, but what you're really doing is overwhelming them and they end up not doing anything. So we really worked hard to try to start taking some of this apart. And this is the new site. Now, this site is not a landmark of great web design. It's, it's a contemporary looking site. Our real intent was not to try to win design awards. Our intent was to try to meet the needs of the audience and to try to be clear and focused and make it easy to find the things that we thought they wanted based on what they told us. So um, most people that come in want to find a community. So we put this really big button up here. Our action color is that orange. It's actually a little darker than that now. Um, we tried to do a lot of things to make this more intuitive. We tried to limit the choices. So as you scroll, you're not looking at an overwhelming series of choices. You're, you're looking at limited sets of information and we tried to make it things that related to different audiences and different things at one time. There's a lot that we sort of have found we could have done better. That orange on white was probably not the best decision that we made and we're rethinking that right now. The way that we show video, um, it's great that it's this big video. We felt like it could be a little more compelling and we're working on that right now. We do these really big call outs and we try to tell people what's going to happen when you click that stuff so that they have some expectation. It's not like a, like a shell game, like click it and see what happens. Um, we tried to organize the footer in ways that, that that information was useful. We get a ton of people, like I'm sure all of you do, coming to the site looking for careers, looking for jobs. So we tried to make that easier for that audience. 
This is one of the community, oops, sorry, this is one of the community home pages. For a lot of people, once they decide which community they're interested in, this really becomes their home page, and they never see that corporate page again. So we really wanted these to be effective as standalone pages. We tried to do things to reduce the, the demand on their attention. So we, we do a lot of tabbed interfaces like this, where we can take a small space and pack a lot of content into it, but do it in a way that they're not overwhelmed by what they're seeing at any given point in time. We're in the process of replacing these ad banners. I talked earlier about our relationship with marketing. Marketing insisted they had to have ad banners. And we kept saying they don't look at the ad banners, but we have to have them. But they don't look at them, but we have to have them. And so we went back and forth and back and forth. And when I get to the testing portion here in a second, I'll show you part of how we sort of resolve some of those debates. Tried to group the content in ways that made sense, similar to the home page. Content areas are grouped. We try to group content related to audiences together so that as you sort of scroll down the page, you're just naturally encountering things, encountering things that relate to you. You're not having things shoved in front of you. Um, we did some interesting things with the navigation that I think are really important that comes up in two more slides. Um, here's how we use video a little more effectively. We're changing these video galleries now to, to make the display of these videos a little cleaner and a little more intuitive than they are now. Um, but we found video is a really effective tool with this audience. There's things that you can say with a video. We're lucky to have our own video team and editing team. And there's things that you can say and do with video that you just can't do as well with content, uh, other types of content. So we try to use that more and more. So here's the navigation piece. One of the things we found was really important is don't take my navigation away from me, don't move stuff around on me, and don't change it. So this whole header stays fixed when you scroll, and this left navigation, which is a little bit of a throwback, um, stays in place. And that left navigation doesn't move, but the content does. So all of those links give you a sort of a overview of what's on this page and as you click any of these things we scroll the content up to you so we use kind of smooth scrolling and anchor links to just bring the content to you you don't have to scroll to it we sort of bring it to you and that helps people maintain their relationship with the content and not have to remember where something was it's an example of one of our floor plan pages this is one of the most popular pages on the site and again, we try to group all the information and we try to be really transparent. So there's the pricing. Here's the photos of what that apartment looks like. There's the floor plan. And it's all on one page. And then at the bottom, if that wasn't what you were looking for, here's other stuff that we think you might be looking for. So you're not clicking all over the place trying to find stuff. In the old site, that page was probably split into three or four pages and you'd be clicking all over the place to try to get that stuff. And just based on the stats, we knew people weren't doing that. So that was a, that was a big kind of win for the redesign. This is our new site. I'm gonna kind of step it up a little bit here, but this is our new site. We revamped this when we uh, redid the site. We actually merged, it was a separate site. We merged it into our main site. Again, try to keep the content browsable. Um, use really big, large blocks. Try to use headlines that, that connect with people. Same calls to action, same large blocks, same orange. This is the newsletter that they did. There were about eight people in the whole company that wanted to do this newsletter. Nobody thought it was a good idea. That newsletter now they started out the year with 250 people on their list. By the end of the year, they were, they were pretty close to 5,000 names. And all they did was put a call out on the website and say, would you like to get our newsletter? So now this thing goes out to 5,000 people every month. It drives a ton of traffic to our corporate site. And we have data that shows that several people from this newsletter ended up moving into the community. So, and it, it cost almost nothing to do. So testing challenges. One of the things, a lot of what you're going to see here is, are things that you see with any group that you test, but there are some issues with seniors that are a little bit unique. 
they're less confident, it's really important to have moderated testing. So you need to have somebody there with them to help them kind of with when they get stuck to ask questions, to kind of interpret what's being said, and sometimes just to ask questions. We, we did a focus group once and we had ad banners on the site and we said, if you wanted to click on an ad banner on the page, where would you go? And we literally watched them roll back and forth over the ad banner. And we had the moderator go, um, are you not interested in the ad banners? And they're like, well, I don't see the ad banner. And we kind of then, oh, I thought that was an image. I didn't know that that was a banner. Um, some people wouldn't click it because they didn't want to go wherever it was going to take them and they don't like ads to begin with, so they were ignoring it. That really helped us when we went back to marketing and said, those ad banners you want, you're the only people that wants them, nobody else does. <laughs> and so we now are in the process of swapping out the ad banners for quick links to content that we know they're more interested in. They're 45% less likely to try an alternative. So if you tell them, I want you to do this, and, and there's another way to do it, they're 45% less likely to do it. They're twice as likely to abandon a task as other audiences, and they give up 30 seconds sooner than other audiences do. And they blame themselves 90% of the time. Now that sounds like a good thing, because you can sit there going, yeah, I don't know. you don't know what you're doing, it's not my fault. Um, it, it is your fault. But the problem is it, it, they give up so quickly because they go, see, I just can't do this, and they move on. That's why you have to make it easy for them because that you know that they're, they kind of come to the whole process thinking they don't know how to do it. You don't want to confirm that for them. 50% of them keep cheat sheets. So they'll bring pads with them, and they'll sit there and write down the names of the pages. Okay, I mean, <laughs> whatever works. But, but so one of the things that told us and that we learned from that is make sure your print style sheet works well because this audience prints a lot of stuff. I mean, we've had people come in to our communities with the entire community website printed out and they made notes on the pages of things they wanted to talk about. So we wouldn't have found that if we hadn't done the testing. They often have banner blindness. I would have said they always have banner blindness, but that's a little too absolute for people. It's not a monolithic audience. There's groups within the groups, and you can't just test for the overall audience. You have to be thinking about the subgroups. 50 to 65, they're pretty careful. After 65, the challenges really start to increase. And don't forget to test the adult children. So how we test, we use litmus to test all of our email. If you never use Litmus, it's great. You can A-B test subject lines, you can A-B test content. It's fantastic, it's a little bit expensive, but it's worth it. Browser stack to test all of our pages. We, we have to deal with so many different browsers and we have so many pages. Something like that's the only way we can keep up with it. We used to use Eloqua and we used to A-B subject test all, we used to A-B test all of our subject lines. We since switched to Pardot. Um, we're still kind of adjusting to Pardot. I can't say that we've had a ton of success with it yet. We've only been on it for about not quite a month, but it provides a ton of analytics beyond what Eloqua gave us. So we're in the process of looking at how we can leverage more of that testing. We do a lot of focus groups. Um, and we don't just focus group on the website. We focus group on how they use technology, what technologies, what are they afraid of, what aren't they afraid of, how do your parents use the web? What do you do with your parents when you look at the web? We, everything, anything we can do. And then I really try to push for anecdotal testing. I try to get people on the team and people in the company to just talk to their family members and ask them, what do you think of our site? What do you like? It, it's pretty random, but we've gotten some really good stuff through that process. That's a look at, at what um, Litmus looks like. <laughs> it doesn't really help you much because it's really hard to see. Um, Optimizely, if you've never used Optimizely, Optimizely lets you do multivariate testing. So you can create different views of a page in Optimizely. You can specify how you want audiences broken out. You can do it by criteria. You can just do it by percentages. You can say, I want half the audience to see this. I want the other half to see this. It then does all the math for you and tells you which one was most successful. 
and it can really help you make decisions about uh, different UI and different imagery and different colors and it also solves a lot of arguments because instead of debating it and arguing, you just build a test, run it, and then, you know, here's what happened. Sorry. Um, here's some of the testing results that we did when we were early on. We did Envision mock-ups and we did testing with our own internal people in blue and then we used usertesting.com which was more random kind of universal testers and we really thought we were going to see a bigger discrepancy but we were actually pretty happy that they came up pretty even. But this is just an example of some of the stuff we looked at early on. The other thing I'd like to mention, um, I was in a presentation earlier and they said enterprise sites take two to three years. Um, we did all of this in less than a year and we built 21 sites, eight, I don't remember, is it, probably somewhere between 18 and 20 sites in four months um, with four people. Um, we were not four happy people, but we, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we built it and we got it done. Um, so here's some quick takeaways, almost done. Um, Know your user, invest in personas, invest in data, and, and invest in focus groups. Those things don't have to cost a lot of money. They can cost a lot of money. If you have a lot of money and can spend it, it's not a bad place to spend it. But you don't have to spend a fortune on it. You just have to figure out how to do it. Accommodate, don't patronize. So make it easier, but don't be insulting. Be intentional, be clear, and be focused. So make sure that People understand what you're trying to say and say what you're trying to say. Don't equivocate. Don't, don't, you know, try to trick people. Limit the number of choices available at any one time. Use contrast really carefully. Use reverse fonts really sparingly. We're actually on our way to eliminating reverse fonts from the website. Um, it's going to take us a little while to get there, but it, it's one of the more challenging accessibility issues, and we're really trying to... Watch the subtle color differences. Watch small fonts. If you have to use small fonts, bold helps. Watch the industry terms and acronyms. Make your forms clear. Make sure that they know what's going to happen when they submit it. And don't assume that because you get it, they're going to get it. You build websites all the time. You use websites all the time. They don't. And you know your industry. They don't. So don't assume because it makes sense to you, it's going to make sense to them. Go ask them and be willing to admit that you were wrong, which is another challenge. Use familiar terms. Keep the navigation options available. Keep the control with the user. That, to me, that's one of the biggest takeaways that I got from the whole process. This is the other one. You have to be transparent. These people come from a generation of used car salesmen, of door-to-door -door salesmen, of bogus infomercials, of people telling you it's going to do this and it doesn't do that, and then they feel like they got taken, and they carry that with them. So you've got to be clear. You've got to be transparent. You're not, you're not going to get them to come in and ask how much something is because you didn't put the price on the website. They're just going to go to your competitor's website that did put the price on there, and they're going to go talk with them. What's good for accessibility is good for seniors. It's good for everyone. It's particularly good for this group. SEO is really important. A major part of our audience comes in from a search. They start with a search. So I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know when I say SEO is important. But it's really important with this audience. Links are good as long as they're clear. If you haven't read Don't Make Me Think, you should go get it and read it. You can read it in an afternoon. It's a great book. And then the last thing, these, these people are doctors, lawyers, teachers, executives, parents. Remember it and respect them when you're building the site for them. Don't build a site that looks like you built it for somebody in preschool and it's built for somebody who maybe used to run a multinational corporation. So this last quote sort of bookended the quotes. Um, it's really important to remember that the stuff we do is being accessed by people all the time. It's becoming the primary way people get news, information, buy things. And if we don't build it in ways that they can all use it, 
we're sort of disabling people's ability to function in society. So it's really important to make sure we do everything we can to make these sites work for them and to make them easy to use and to make them accessible. So that's it. Any questions? <laughs> Made it with five, five minutes to spare. I didn't think I would do that. Question? Oh. Right. And, and you have a team of four or five, and one of those people is a web analyst? Two of them are developers. One's a web analyst, one's an intern. And I'm really curious if you'd be willing to share the job description for your web analyst, because as part of a web development team that works with our internal marketing team quite a bit, uh -huh. that feels like that's a missing piece for us. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I would share it. I'd have to find it, but I'd share it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, cool. I'll, I, my emails. Okay, I'll, email I'll you. get it. You can get it from me. I'd be happy to share it with you. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you're seeing seniors um, have a lot of engagement on Facebook, and you mentioned you're having success with the ads on Facebook. They're clicking through. Are you also seeing that they're sharing your website on Facebook and engaging with like your group? Um, I would say yes. It's anecdotal more than I don't have any direct data. We've been working on trying to figure that out. Um, Cross-browser stuff's still a little tricky, but we're, we definitely see that they pass stuff around and we know that they, you know, they have friends, they have neighbors. You know, one of the things we see is somebody moves out of a community and that community, the people in that community are starting to reach the age where this is something that they're thinking about. So one neighbor comes in, they tell another neighbor. We do see some of that, but I don't have any data really that I can specifically quote numbers from. Um, so usually when we talk about accessibility, uh, we talk about things like screen readers or like tabbing through the page. Yep. Um, and things like that have a really high learning curve, right? And I would imagine that there would be at least some seniors that would be a lot more hesitant to embrace things like that. And I was wondering if you had any data or thoughts or came across that or even understand what I'm trying to ask? Um, that's a really great question. And no, I don't. Um, <laughs> I wish I did. I, I can tell you that we, we happen to be located pretty close to the Natu National Federation for the Blind. Mm -hmm. And they have a tremendous accessibility group. Um, and I did speak with a couple people from there about some of the things that that they've learned and how we could sort of translate that to what we do. Um, but we don't, we don't have, a, I would love to have more of that information. I'm trying to get more of that information. I can also tell you that while accessibility is really, really important to us, our site is not fully accessible yet. It's on its way. Some, we're, we're in pretty good shape in certain areas. There's also some pretty glaring omissions that we're trying to work through. Um, so. You know, usually when I do these things, somebody goes, well, you said this, and I just went on your site, and it doesn't do that. So, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just uh, really thinking about, like, zooming in, for example, yep. like, to make the font sizes bigger. Yep. Uh, does everybody know how to zoom in? So, that's uh, a great question. One of the things we did is we, you can't see it in the comps, but if you go to the website, um, we have a toolbar that gives them the ability to zoom the page. So um, we, that's a great example of, yeah, you can do it from within the system if you know how to do it. Most people don't. So we sort of put a button there. You can just keep clicking and the fonts get bigger. And so, yeah. Two questions. One, the, all the research you've done and obviously you've spent money on, are you willing to make that available so we can kind of see what you got out of that, or is that for internal use only? Um, I, I'm willing to share it. Um, I'm, I have to talk to some of my bosses and see if they're okay with sharing. Well, that, so a little bit more immediate um, with your findings, uh, scrolls versus clicks. Do you see? What do you see the audience? hovering towards? Is, do, are they more willing to scroll or would they rather click to get to the information um, they want? So we did, we did, we used um, Crazy Egg and a couple other things on the site to, to do scroll testing. And we were actually surprised about, s I'm not going to get these numbers right. 
upwards of about 30 to 40 percent of the audience was making it to the bottom of the page, even on really long pages, which honestly really surprised me. Um, since we changed to the, sort of the anchors approach and bringing the content to them, it kind of skews some of those numbers because they're not scrolling, the page is coming to them, so it's been a little harder to get data on those, but we, and we also tried breaking the really big pages down into more compact, kind of centralized content, so that changed things a little bit too. But we, we've seen page engagement keep going up. We're, I think our time on site now is, once they get into the communities, in some cases it's as high as three or four minutes, five minutes in some cases. And we've, we've, when we started, when I got here, we were at about 90,000 page views a month. We just crossed 200,000, um, I think last week, actually. And we're seeing it continue to rise. So most of the numbers are really good. Our bounce rate's still a little higher than I'd like it to be. Um, it's depending on which page you're on, some of them are up around 30, 40%. Um, didn't surprise me on the corporate page, on the, the sub pages, I like to see it a little lower. And it, it's been dropping, so it's moving the right direction, but I don't know if that answers your question or not. Hey, I, I'm interested in all the testing you're doing. Can you talk about how you schedule it? Do, are you on a, do you have a, a map where it's like, these are the tests we're gonna run at these points, or is it a little bit more ad hoc? Um, so this is where what I tell you is not in any way going to relate to reality. Um, <laughs> we try to test as much as we can whenever we can, but we have such a small team and we're so busy that a lot of times what it comes down to is just kind of empowering people in the team to be able to use these tools and let them go do tests sort of on their own whenever they have time to do them. Um, we do... As part of development, we try to block out time for testing before we release. Sometimes we do it really, really well. Sometimes we do what we can before we have to launch it, and then we figure it out after. Thank you. Are you going to share your slides? Yeah, yeah, I'll share the slides. All right. You can post them on Twitter or something? Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure how DrupalCon does it. I think I post them to... Yeah, what she said. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do that, and, and you're welcome to get my email address and email me, and I'll send it to you if you can't get it any other way. I, there's nothing in here that's proprietary, so. Okay. Oh. Real quick, what about retargeting with this audience? We we do it, um, and we've had... I would say we've had success with it. I, I was a little apprehensive about it. I wanted to do it. I was a little concerned about it freaking people out. Um, to be honest, with this whole Facebook thing, I'm even more concerned about retargeting. Um, I think it's, I think it's like anything else we do. I'm open to trying anything that makes sense, um, but I want to try to understand. <laughs> oh, great. Um, I want to understand kind of the downside, and um, and I like us to do that kind of stuff in a in a limited release way, so that we can sort of pilot it and see kind of how they react to it. Um, retargeting's work; it's really expensive, or at least it can be. Um, and we we've got decent budgets for ad buys, but not enormous ones. So we try to be a little careful with that. Anything else? Okay, well, thanks a lot. Really appreciate you taking the time to come out this way. Yes, sir.